Good evening. I'm Sherry, and I'm a seed saver. That might not mean much to you now, but hopefully by the end of this talk, it might mean something to you. Well, I make the connection between seeds, community, and bellies. Now I'll let you know I'm not a professional seed saver. I know some of the rules, like if you plant a pumpkin and a zucchini in the same year in the same garden, and you save seeds, you might get a pumpkini the next year. And sometimes I do save seeds intentionally. Like here, every year I grow some blue corn, some popcorn, and sunflower seeds, both for eating and also for planting the next year. But many times I don't even realize that I'm saving seeds. And I do it without intention. After wanders in the woods, I oftentimes come home with pockets full of seeds. So much so, I'm realizing that I might be a seed kleptomaniac. <laughs> so, I first got, uh, I first became part of the local food movement with an uh, organization called GRUB, Growing Resourcefully, Uniting Bellies. And through our work advocating for gardening and for local food, I realized that there was a missing link, and that, I'm realizing, is local seeds. Now, my first experience with seed, uh, community seed projects, was during a trip to a farm conference. And while we were enjoying all the events they had to offer, I went to something called a seed swap. I had no idea what to expect. But when I walked in the door, there were seeds everywhere. Tables full of seeds, like these, without labels on them, or without commercial pre-printed labels, all hand done. And you can imagine a seed klepto, like myself, went pretty crazy. I was fortunate because I wasn't prepared. They did provide envelopes and pencils and all of that. This was all for free, and I believe their intention was for us to go home to our communities to plant these seeds and then to share them with our communities. Well, I didn't exactly share those seeds. I did with the help of my collaborator on all things seedy, Stephanie Ladwig Cooper, we started seed swaps here in Chico. We just finished, we just got to celebrate our fifth annual seed swap, and our fifth annual spring seed swap, and our second annual fall seed swap. And just like the original that I went to, it's free, it's a fun event, and people get to take home seeds to share. After five years, it's been growing, and it's been growing great, and each year we get to see more and more people bringing seeds that they save back to share with our neighbors. But we wanted, we wanted greater access for the community to seeds. We also really wanted more education on how to correctly save seeds and all those rules I was talking about. So we had heard something about a seed library. And we investigated, talked about it, and then we went to the local county library. And the librarian there was excited. She immediately started the talks, and this last fall, we opened Cecil, Chico's Seed Lending Library. It's open to the public. It's open during the hours that the library is open. And anybody who's a member of the library could come and borrow seeds. We're hoping that then those people who borrow seeds will learn how to save seeds and bring them back to the library the next year to share with our neighbors. Now, can you imagine if all of us in, this er in our region are collecting the seeds from our tastiest tomatoes or our tastiest plants, our best growing plants, and we share them with each other? We're going to be getting regionally adapted and resilient seeds, perfect for this climate, for our specific environment. Well, and there's a slide about the inside. There's drawers of seeds, and you get to choose it yourself. So I haven't, I haven't really struck your belly yet, have I? And this might not. If you look at this slide, you might see a bunch of weeds, as I do. 
But summer 9,000 years ago or so, the ancient peoples were able to look at some wild native grasses and see a potential. Over, I imagine, hundreds of years, they, they kept collecting. There was a grass that had about eight kernels on it, small, about as hard as rocks. But they kept saving the best ones year after year after year until they got corn. And more and more years of selecting and breeding, we now have popcorn and sweet corn, dent corn, flower corn, red corn, blue corn, so many colors. So thousands of years of a beautiful relationship with corn. My next seed story will really appeal to your belly, at least it does for me. If it were a sunnier day, I'd really be feeling the, the taste of a melon. This one starts, it has its history here in Chico, California. Our founder, the city founder, John Bidwell, in around 1900, received some generic cassava melon seeds from the USDA. He planted them. He grew them out, he chose the best ones, and did this again and again and again until he got what us foodies and farmers know as Bidwell's cassava. Now this one, we probably wouldn't have known about it, well, if there weren't some seed savers, local seed savers, who had been saving this one. It is delicious, it's huge, like nine pounds. It's juicy. Some people say that it tastes like orange sherbet. But it takes a really long, hot summer to grow. Perfect for Chico's climate. Unfortunately, the stores won't carry it because it's soft. It bruises easily. It's, it's not good. Um, it's not easily transported. And it's not easily marketed because it's not a watermelon, a cantaloupe, or a honeydew. It doesn't really fit any of those molds. And that's probably why people had kind of forgotten about it and why it almost went extinct. So luckily, some seed, seed historians or melon enthusiasts, somebody rediscovered it. And now it's in a lot of catalogs and available for all of us to grow. Next one. The next seed story is a brandywine tomato. Now this one is probably the most popular, most famous heirloom tomato. Just like all the rest of the tomatoes, they all have these great stories. Some of them, well let's see, the USDA says that there may be 25,000 varieties of tomatoes out there, 25,000, and each of them with a story. A lot of them were plant breeders or maybe plant companies who who specifically was breeding them and, and came up with new varieties, but so many of them can be traced along familial heritage. They've been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And it's a beautiful story, lots of beautiful stories. This one, it's a little bit cloudy, but the story I want to talk about is the adaptability part of it. Now, brandy wines are famous, they're delicious, everybody wants to grow them, but they're not the most productive tomato. And in our climate, they actually don't produce very well in our hot summers. They drop, their, they drop their flowers, they drop their fruit when it's super hot. And I, unknowingly, I've been buying my organic seeds from an East Coast seed company who buys them from seed farmers back there who are selecting the seeds from plants that are doing well in their climate, not my climate. So I'm realizing, how do I expect those plants to do well in Chico summer heat. But what if you had a neighbor who was getting prolific amounts of brandywine tomatoes? Wouldn't you want some of their seeds to share? That's a, that's a good one. And the last seed story I want to share with you is kind of a pet project of mine. These ones are, this one's called a uh, German pole bean. If you can ima imagine, each, each one of those seeds is going to grow into a vigorous plant, vigorous vine, it takes off. And it's gonna provide me with an amazing amount of tender green beans throughout the summer. So much so that I just let them go to seed. And then those seeds can be cooked and turned into delicious dry beans. 
And then I save. I still have enough to save seeds for the next year. And along the way, a lot of seeds fall on the ground. And amazingly, these ones don't rot over the winter, but they volunteer and they re-sprout the next, the next year. In a sense, me as a seed saver is kind of obsolete with them. But one of the fun parts about this story is that it came to me from three different people. When I question them, they don't know each other, but they each gave them to me and said, these are German pole beans. They each gave me the same descriptions of the plants. They each had been saving them for many years, some even for decades, and they passed along to other friends around the Chico area. And when I look it up on the internet, there's no information about German pole beans. So I'm coming to realize that I think that these are an undiscovered Chico heirloom. So, you know, as our resources, climate and environment are going through changes, we will need to adapt. But I hope if we all work together, it will not be at the expense of delicious foods. Dr. Vandana Shiva said, seed is the source of life and the first link in our food chain. Community seed projects are the missing link we need to our local, local food system. And if you don't have seed swaps, seed banks, or seed libraries in your community, it's really easy to start them. There's some templates online that you can follow. Um, and there's a great, great network out there to help. And tonight I ask, maybe you could become a seed saver too, but tonight I ask you to know your farmer, but also know your seed farmer. Thank you.